Ever since Bungie's 30th anniversary started, I've exclusively been playing Attunement of Grace or Well of Radiance in PvP, and I'm here to tell you that holy shacks, this thing is good and honestly a very competitive choice for winning matches in Trials and Survival. You definitely want a Well of Radiance Warlock on your team, and today, I'll show you why. I'll teach you all the ins and outs of Attunement of Grace, how to use it in PvP to its fullest effect, and I think you're gonna love this one. It took me the whole season to make this video, but I had so much fun. For me, this was Season of the Well. So I'm someone who loves to totally dedicate myself to mastering something for a long chunk of time, finding all the cool nuances that make it unique, and then summarizing what I've learned. I've done this with Blink on Warlock, Hammers on Titan, and I recently tried out Hunter seriously for the first time and reviewed the class as a whole along with Destiny 2's seasonal model. I'll never become the best player in the game with just a few months of dedicated practice, but I will get pretty good and I'll eventually get to know a playstyle in Destiny much much better by simply spending time with it and seeing where it hurts, where it excels, and how to use it to adapt to a variety of situations. Having these experiences where I fully commit myself to learning something even through the growing pain has made me an incredibly better player, but it's also just been wildly fun, and that's the reason we all play video games, so having this much fun just kind of rules. Anyway, mastering the Attunement of Grace in PvP was no different this season. I basically didn't take it off no matter what activity I was playing, and while it came with a lot of growing pains and funny moments too, it also resulted in some of the most fun I've ever had in PvP, and I became a better player. So here's how Attunement of Grace works. But actually, hold up, we should have a name for this way of life, and I think the best options are Well, Wellock, Wellington, or Nurse. If you're a Wellock, you are the anchor of your team, providing support through damage boosts and healing boosts, and giving your teammates big chunks of their super energy because of how fast your super charges and how many orbs it provides. Okay, first up, Rifts. You could choose the Healing Rift on this class, and it's great on any class, but I think specifically when you play well, you have a great opportunity to run Empowering Rift and still be plenty healthy. On this class, you're going to be getting so many grenades that it's well worth running the Empowering Rift instead for the 20% damage boost, which will allow you to two-tap Guardians with 120 RPM hand cannons or kill them in one body shot with a high-impact snipe rifle, provided their resilience level is under 50. Both rifts recharge faster based on how high your recovery level is, so I think it is absolutely mandatory to run 100 recovery on Warlock, which means you'll be getting rifts every 30 seconds or so thanks to Benevolent Dawn, which is incredibly powerful since a rift can dominate a lane and force your enemies to go somewhere else. Not to mention, if they do decide to peek you, you'll almost assuredly get one kill because of that high damage boost. Both rifts take about 2 seconds to place, though Empowering Rift is a little bit faster, which is nice. They both last 15 seconds long, and they both span an area of about 5 meters. But between the massive 20% damage boost and the fact you'll have plenty of healing grenades on this class, I absolutely think the play here is choosing Amp Rift. Benevolent Dawn is probably the most powerful perk of this subclass, and one of the most powerful subclass perks in the entire game right now, because it causes your melee, rift, and grenades to recharge much, much faster if you just give your allies buffs. You don't even need kills, and getting more solar grenades or more rifts is really powerful these days. Thank you for the heal grenade. Sure thing. Well, Sven, we got A. Are you happy? Benevolent Dawn activates for about 3 seconds whenever you smack someone with your melee ability and an ally is nearby, and this currently activates as well whether it's charged or not. Benevolent Dawn also activates for 3 seconds whenever you heal someone by converting your grenade into a heal by holding down the grenade button, and it also activates whenever an ally walks through your rift even just for a moment. And if an ally stands in your rift or your well for a long duration, Benevolent Dawn just stays active that entire time, and the 6 second timer starts when they leave the rift. So if somebody spends a moment with you in your rift, you're just getting your abilities back really quickly. And it's kind of nice to hang out in rifts with people. It's like a, it's a nice place to hang out. Remember as well this one is. Well done. <laughs> Altogether, smacking your enemies, healing your allies, and placing rifts is already very natural behavior for a warlock, so you'll be getting your abilities back incredibly quickly without having to do anything different. This is particularly powerful these days since everyone else in the sandbox has experienced ability cooldown nerfs across the board, which means that unless they're also building into really fast ability cooldowns, you're just going to have more abilities than them. And honestly, even if they have built into ability cooldowns, you'll probably still have more because of how generous Benevolent Dawn is and how frequently it activates. 
Okay, as for the melee ability, which is called Guiding Flame, this empowers you and any allies within about 25 meters and gives you a 25% damage boost for 10 seconds, which is incredibly powerful. That's the same damage boost that your Well of Radiance provides, but you just get it for a whopping 10 seconds if you melee someone. In my experience, that comes into play very frequently in every match I play, and it feels like I'm just getting charged with light plus high energy fire randomly for free all the time. What's more, the burn damage this melee does is actually like really effective. It keeps people weak for a very long time because it does seven ticks of about six to seven damage a piece, and it does 120 damage on impact. So basically your melee ability is doing over 160 damage alone, and it's literally almost always gonna be charged because of Benevolent Dawn. So like if you put in just one hand cannon body shot, you can melee someone and run away and they'll die. And it's amazing. Or if you die, that's kind of fine too, because if it's like a 3v3 mode, your teammates will have a lot more breathing room to recalibrate since the person you meleeed is going to be out of the fight for a big chunk of time while they recover 160 damage spread out over 5 seconds or more, and while they're out, you essentially just charge your teammates with light up to a 25% damage boost, which is a bit higher than normal, and all in all I'd say that's enough time and breathing room to either get a revive or just fight that 2v2 while that third enemy is recovering, and you can totally change the swing of a fight in your team's favor. I found this melee ability to be really powerful, and paired with this subclass's grenades and rapid ability recharge time, it's a force to be reckoned with. Speaking of the grenades, if you're playing Welluck, that means you can choose solar grenades, which are like some of the best grenades in the whole game. Now, of course, you could choose firebolts if you like snagging people for a little tickle of damage around a corner, which is totally fine, but firebolts are actually super viable, because if you want to use them for healing grenades, because you'll be getting them extremely quickly, you could absolutely do that, and you could have a healing grenade for almost every encounter. Or you could go with fusion grenades if you like sticking people and still having a pretty fast grenade cooldown. Fusions are a tiny bit slower compared to firebolts, but they're still very fast and certainly viable. Plus, if you pair them with Starfire Protocol, which doubles the fusion grenades you can hold up to two and gives you fusion grenades back faster every time you deal empowered damage, which is going to happen basically every single fight you take, then it means you will quite literally have a heal grenade for every single person you fight, even in trials. I used Starfire Protocol in trials, I could heal every teammate and myself several times throughout every single round, and it was immensely powerful. Now, however good fusion grenades and fireball grenades are, I don't think that they're as good as solar grenades, which have long reigned supreme and for good reason. They inflict a high amount of damage, and damage that lasts over time due to the burn effect, which is extremely useful for keeping enemies out of the fight for longer and tracking them through walls for a bit, and these things can also easily sneak their damage around corners and through titan barricades, which makes them the best grenade in the game in my opinion. But hey, maybe you're worried about that long cooldown time, which is fair, but when you're at like 70 to 100 discipline on a Tomb of Grace, and you use something like Bomber or Grenade Kickstart, and you're using Benevolent Dawn naturally, you're gonna get Solar Grenades unbelievably quickly, even faster if you run mods. Solar Grenades are incredibly powerful for destruction and murder, but even if you convert many of them to Healing Grenades, you're still gonna have a bunch of them, just because of how this subclass works. So I'd say even if you like using grenades for healing, probably still go with the solar nade just in the off chance you need that grenade damage because you're going to get it back really fast anyway. When you convert any Attunement of Grace grenade into a healing grenade by holding your grenade button for about 0.8 seconds, they take on a new form. By throwing this heal nade, you can heal allies from afar provided they are within about 4 meters of where the grenade lands. When it's picked up, it instantly heals all health and shield points and provides an overshield of about 35 health points. And if you're at full health and pick one of these up, your overshield is only 35 points, which is really not much, so I would highly recommend saving this grenade for when you and your teammates are hurt rather than popping it in advance of a fight and then aping in. Unless, of course, you're using this as a highly coordinated strategy, and you're going up against a team where you know your teammates and your enemies are all about to hit every single shot, and you know that victory is literally going to come down to like 30 hit points of your team's collective HP. If you realize you're in a super sweaty scenario like that and you want to try that play, then giving your full team a small overshield and all pushing in at the exact same time and hitting your shots can definitely result in victory, but that requires a lot of coordination. I've personally found that this grenade heal buff, which is called Divine Protection, is much more realistically going to be used when you did a ton of damage to an enemy and they also did a ton of damage to you, then you dip back into cover for 0.8 seconds, heal yourself completely with an overshield, and you re-challenge and you win. Or if you're the one who took all the damage and you didn't do any damage to your opponent, you're definitely going to catch them off guard when they ape in and you're at full health. 
You can catch a lot of people off guard with this and win fights that you have no business winning. Or if you're with a teammate and you're peeking a lane together and they take too much damage to re-peek again with you, just throw your divine protection at your feet, instantly full heal and overshield both of you, and then you can re-peek together instantly and take out one or two enemies together. All in all, divine protection is truly unique and can totally change the tide of any duel. It'll be available to you as a nurse very frequently and you'll be able to heal your friends and scare your enemies. Good stuff. Okay, the final ability we need to talk about on the Beef Wellington subclass tree is just your super. Instead of a fiery Dawnblade sword that you can run around with and huck fire at people, this grace node is just modifying that and makes it so that when you pop your sword, you actually just slam it into the floor and create a massive pool of magical healing and damage boosting energy around you that you and your allies can use for 30 seconds, which is quite some time. What's more, Popping the Well creates three large orbs of power, which is a hefty chunk of super for your teammates, but we'll talk more about that strategy later on. Uh, orb time. Putting on gold box. This is so mean. <laughs> Just like the empowered melee damage buff, Well of Radiance provides a plus 25 boost to all your damage, so you can absolutely melt anyone who peeks you, but most of the time people will just run away from your well if they see you popped it, but that's okay. Area Denial is still super strong in Destiny PvP. The well also heals you at a rate of about 130 HP every one second, and it can charge you up to a greater overshield than the normal Divine Protection overshield. It'll get you up to 70 HP of overshield instead of 30. So essentially you have around 270 HP if you're standing in a well at full health with the overshield. However, you also have a little damage resistance. Even so, this means you can die to a sniper headshot from a high impact sniper, but adaptive frames or rapid fire frames can't kill you with a headshot, which is really nice because a lot of people are using adaptive frames these days for the low zoom level. Oh, also when you pop your well, it actually does a small explosion of burn damage that can sometimes kill your enemies, which is super funny. And I just love getting kills with the well sword. I think it's one of the funniest and most badass ways to get a kill in Destiny PvP. And that's honestly a huge reason why I choose to play nurse in Destiny. Okay, now I need to explain how Stasis currently interacts with your Well of Radiance because it's not what people think, and if you want to master the Nurse, you need to know this. So many people think if you're standing in a well you aren't affected by stasis, but this isn't entirely true. If you're going up against a Silence and Squall Hunter, which is very common these days, you actually need to be careful about how you pop your well, because you need to defend the well's sword. Your well sword is actually susceptible to stasis damage, and all damage for that matter. So if an enemy shoots your sword, which has about 300 HP, or they shoot the orb above the sword, which is also a way to damage the well, then they can actually kill the well. So you need to be careful to place your well in a way that gives your enemies very little or zero way to damage the well's infrastructure. This is an important skill for all nurses to have, so if you're considering joining Team Nurse, please be mindful of your sword placement. As for the stasis tornado, it can actually freeze your sword and then do stasis damage to the sword just by being near it. However, this is the key. The area of effect that the tornado can damage your well sword is actually kind of small. Like the tornado needs to be right on top of the sword. And what's more, the tornado needs direct line of sight to the sword in order to do damage to it. Furthermore, the tornado's tracking can't track an inanimate object like the sword. It'll always track to the nearest person. So if you place your well around a corner and then engage your enemy or your enemy's tornado, tornado, your sword will be completely safe because the tornado will be tracking to you and it'll stay away from your well sword. So you can safely have all of the well's benefits, have zero effect of the slow stacks from stasis, and you'll have the peace of mind that the sword will survive provided a foolish teammate doesn't draw the tornado into the sword themselves. However, I found the tornado will often just focus on you because you're going to be the first to engage with it, and then all you need to do is remain in the epicenter of the tornado and not in the center of the well, and the tornado should stay tracked onto you rather than injuring your sword, and the slow stacks won't do anything to you, it'll just kind of obscure your vision. While this may seem a bit complicated, it really is straightforward since you just need to think about where you place your well for only a moment before popping it. But say you need to pop the well out of cover where people and tornadoes can get at it, that's perfectly fine too. You just need to shoot the other guys more than they shoot you and you should be good. And if you're in a place where a tornado is able to damage your well, that's perfectly fine too. You just have to remember to leave the well within about five to seven seconds, which is how long the sword can resist the tornado. So if you need to get a revive in trials or contest an area on a map or something and it's affected by stasis, that's perfectly fine. Just know that popping your well as a countermeasure out of cover means you do need to be aware of some of the limitations and be ready to leave the well sooner than you're used to if the tornado is hurting your sword. But sometimes all you really need is that five to seven seconds. 
So all in all, Well of Radiance remains to be a highly effective counter to Stasis, and I highly recommend it these days in PvP, where Stasis and Revenant in particular remains a popular choice as well. There's nothing quite like getting supered, popping your well, and totally Uno card reversing that poor hunter. It is exhilarating. Oh, also one thing to know is that the first part of Silence and Squall, the silence part I guess, is actually just a little chunk of ice that the hunter is throwing at you. So if you're an ally of this hunter, and honestly I think if you're an enemy as well, when they throw the ice cube at you, you can actually interact with it in game since it's a solid object and you can kind of like scramble on top of it. So grantling on top of an ice cube sure is fun, but the final and most exciting part of Well of Radiance is absolutely the well launch. Oh my god, I love doing this. Oh my god, <laughs> that was sick. <laughs> I'm so excited to show people that clip. This is the I've ever seen. Wow. Initially, people thought it was something only stasis hunters could do, but after I watched Hinra's video on this, I learned that Wellington Warlocks can do it too. It's accomplished by hitting the heavy attack button with a sword that has this perk eager edge on it, which causes you to fly forward with a ton of momentum. If you press the jump button right after your heavy attack and then the super button, all of which has to happen in the span of like half a second, then you will send yourself flying across the map with a massive amount of momentum. It's some of the most fun I've ever had in Destiny, and I cannot get enough of this. It sends you flying with so much momentum that it's really easy to kill yourself by slamming into a wall or a small branch or something because you really can't change your direction once you start. But if you line it up just right, you can make some really amazing plays happen. It actually took me hours to learn this in private mayhem matches because I wanted to have the ability to reliably do this back to back to back to back with no failures. If I could do that, I knew I'd be ready for taking it into regular PvP matches where if you mess it up, you're screwed because you'll pop your super if you mess it up, which probably means you have to wait a while to get another super, or wait to get more heavy. So it's really hard to get it to happen in public matches because you really only get like two chances a match. But once I could do it reliably, I took it into PvP and had an absolute blast sending myself shooting across the entire map and catching people off guard. This is the cherry on the cake for me that seriously makes me want to never take Well of Radiance off. I love the potential for just incredible clips here and I can't wait to see what I'm able to pull off with this in the future. Ooh, I'm gonna try to well skate over there. Alright. Here, you can have my uh, rocket, Sabrina. I already have- Oh yeah, god. So. Oh no. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, it worked. Oh my god. <laughs> that oh was no. awesome. <laughs> oh oh my that. god. Let's go. I can, you know, I'm going to record that. But if you do pull it off, it's very jarring and people just don't know what to do or how to react. I like Rihanna. Ooh, well launch. What the? <laughs> 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 all right, now that you know all the ins and outs of how Wellock abilities work, I want to share with you a few of my favorite builds to run while playing Nurse, and then I'll wrap up with some Nurse tips for high-level PvP to beat some really good teams in Trials, Scrims, or Comp. I'm not really going to go over Ophidian aspects or transverse of steps because these are just universally god-tier builds for any Warlock setup, and I'm sure everyone already has these ready to go, so there's really no point. First up, Starfire Protocol. This exotic gives you two fusion grenade charges, and every time you do damage in an empowering rift, you get fusion grenade energy back. If you pair this with Bomber on your class item, and then you factor in how the class perk Benevolent Dawn gives you much faster cooldowns, I kid you not, you'll have a fusion grenade for every single gunfight you take. Like four grenades, if not more, for every single round in Trials. Unless you're just dying immediately. But if you just stay alive and throw your grenades, use your rift, do some damage with your primary, it's nuts. Every single time you take damage, you can just instantly heal yourself with a fusion grenade, and then seconds later, you'll have another fusion grenade. What's more, if you get a fusion grenade kill, you'll have a chunk of rift energy back too. You'll feel like the most powerful nurse in the whole galaxy with Starfire Protocol. The gameplay loop on this one is super fun and pairs perfectly with the Attunement of Grace subclass tree to give you plenty of rifts and actually infinite grenades for every engagement. I think Starfire is remarkably exciting and offers some next level opportunities to be a really solid anchor on your team. Not to mention if you find a good Starfire build, you could use it on top tree Dawnblade and literally just play an entire match hovering in the air with Heat Rises if you wanted to. Now for my beloved exotic that I use the most this season, Lunafaction Boots. 
Oh my god, I am obsessed with these things. I spent the most time by far on Luna Factions, and to be honest, I think Starfire Protocol is probably a much more viable choice for being a truly god-tier nurse in Destiny, but Luna Factions is what I ended up spending the most time on because it's just so dang fun and silly and can get you some really funny clips. Plus, Lunas are like actually good, which is cool. Luna Faction boots buff your reload speed and your rift, everybody knows that, they're great for PvE, but that's actually pretty nice for anchoring in PvP too, but what's much more exciting about them is that while while you're in your empowering rift, you actually get massively increased weapon range, which is super fun and really powerful. Destiny Sandbox makes it so every weapon has an optimal range, which I love. But sometimes it's fun to break the game a little bit and do something ridiculous like using a 120 RPM hand cannon to two-tap a DMT player across the map. The fact alone that weapon range is such a universally understood and respected thing in the PvP community, like everyone knows SMGs are good around 20 meters or a little bit more. That fact alone means that when you suddenly change the range rules on somebody with Luna Factions or a weapon perk and you're just like, no, actually I get to use this weapon at any range and do full damage and have full aim assist, like that just really catches people off guard. And when you're fighting good opponents, that's a big part of the game is not being predictable and doing a metric ton of damage so they have to play with their primary weapons more. Some of the scariest teams out there are just like the ones with Thorn and a Felwinner's Lie. They've had this loadout on for their entire life, they play highly coordinated with their team, they know exactly what to expect from the general public in PvP, and they're just trying to do as much damage as quickly as possible so they can just stompy jump in and shotgun you easily. If they come around a corner and in an instant you do 100 damage to one of them and 100 to their friend, that puts a big wrench in their plans and they need to recover health. Luna Factions allows this to happen. If you equip a 120 RPM hand cannon and you encounter a team of hunters who have not invested the appropriate time into getting a high resilience stat, you can seriously mess them up. You might lose if your team is uncoordinated or they have a really good sniper on their team, but with something like Luna Factions that just totally changes the range expectations and time to kill expectations people have, then you can beat some really good teams who are not ready for the ranges at which you can deal out some big damage or even a kill. Oh, also, quick shout out to the chaperone map kill that you can get with Lunas because of the buffed range. It's very funny and fun. It isn't really something I actually have used a whole lot or feel like I can rely on, but it is pretty funny when it happens, and I'm looking forward to keeping the Lunas and chaperone on just in case some funny clips happen in the future. Also, speaking of weapons, I do highly prefer 120 RPM hand cannons with this build since you can two tap a lot of people or just like chunk someone's health bar, and even if you don't get a kill, it's really nice. And I also love running slug shotguns. I just love how reliable they are, and I love using my Philo roll. It's my baby. But Chaperone is an excellent choice because it gives you the intrinsic lightweight bonus of faster sprint speed and more mobility, not to mention massive range. So it's really good for keeping up right alongside your transverse of Dune Marcher or Stompy Marine teammates while you have on Lunas. Plus, with Warlock, you can put on Burst slide and warlock skate or eventually you'll get good at stair launching reliably and in the distances that you want to stair launch which can make you much faster than anyone else which is really fun with my Luna Factions build, I'm able to hit 100 recovery, high discipline, medium intellect, which means I'm getting the first super, and waste very few stat points while still having room for the mods that really matter to me. On top of that, Luna Factions allows me to have some very silly fun in the game and also contend with very good teams. This hybrid of a great stat spread, the ability to goof off, and the fact that they're actually competitive in sweaty PvP, not to mention I think they look awesome, which is extremely important to me, well, all these things together, it just makes it so this build is utterly perfect for me, and I've had it on basically all season because it's just so dang fun. Good to engage us. Oh, that's yeah. the Luna's prop. I'm a lot with my gun. You're to that Luna's Rift gave me insane hand cannon range. <laughs> it yeah. does that. That was wild. It's so much fun. Yep. All right, for the penultimate chapter of this video, I want to explain why I think Attunement of Grace was the perfect candidate for a deep dive this season for one reason more than any other reason, and that's that it was one of the most eye-catching options after the massive changes to super regeneration speed. As of the 30th anniversary expansion, the intellect stat is far less impactful on how fast you get your super, and now it's all about doing primary damage. And furthermore, all the supers in the game got bucketed into five tiers, with tier one being the slowest super recharge time and tier five being the fastest. You can 
watch my buddy Castle's video on this if you want to understand how you need to play to get supers these days. It's honestly fascinating. So the most iconic and deadly supers in the game like Striker, Spectral Blades, and Top Tree Dawnblade are going to take quite a while to recharge compared to supers like Nova Bomb, Blade Barrage, or of course our friend the Well of Radiance which is the sole tier 5 super in the game right now and experiences the fastest recharge time compared to any others. I personally have loved this change and it's made the game much more interesting and replayable for me so I'm really delighted. But if I totally remove my personal perspective from this I gotta say this change actually creates a really fascinating equation in the game that you should be aware of. It harks back to Destiny's early days of super economy strategy in scrims and competitive matches where the strategy back in the day was pacing your team's super pops and anticipating when yours versus the enemy's supers would come up. And that sense of timing supers was like a seriously important skill for winning. And it still is of course, that has never gone away, but this change has made it more impactful and made it different and it's just made it more important to build into a diverse set of supers on your team so you have some supers come up quicker and some come up later. Like you're basically creating your team's deck of cards and stacking it in your favor with an action plan over the course of the match as you're drawing cards. And this is just fascinating to me because it means the Well of Radiance is like the lifeblood of your team loadout, like the kickstart near the top of your team's deck that can totally swing the tide in your favor and get you started. And that's because upon popping your well, you drop three large orbs of light, which is a ton these days, and it gives your teammates a really nice chunk of their super energy, and that's invaluable. I think this is one of the most exciting parts of the Well of Radiance because it puts you in such an interesting and important place in your team where you need to stay alive and put in damage, buff your teammates, and basically be an anchor because you're like this battery that's just charging up and then going to jumpstart your teammates' slower, deadly supers, causing you to steamroll the enemy before they get their supers. It's such a cool dynamic and it's so dang fun. So here's what I see as one of the most powerful trials or survival decks and how it builds together with a Nurse Wellington battery to absolutely slay out. Okay, first get an intellect level of at least 50 to 70 on your Nurse, the higher the better without going over 70. She needs to be able to generate those three orbs as quickly as possible. She should use an empowering rift, healing grenades, and a long range primary weapon to be able to put in plenty of primary damage and charge up her super. It's imperative your nurse stays alive as long as possible to get as much super energy as possible. Next up, get you a Thundercrash Titan, give them a shotgun, give them Doom Marchers, and tell them to start trolling with a close range primary weapon. Ideally, they're going to know how to push conservatively so they can be a little mosquito peppering your enemies, causing frustration, and making them unsure about where to push. If this Titan's going to go on flanks, they need to not die, but if they're in a situation where they could do their Titan pounce on Middle Tree Striker and get one or two melee tags or a kill, they should absolutely take this opportunity because every time they tag someone with their melee, they actually get quite a bit of super energy even if it isn't a kill. If around lasts for a long time and they're the only one alive, I think they should just bide their time, try to clutch up, but if they tag two or even three people with that melee slam and they still lose the round, that's honestly actually a win for your team because that thunder crash is going to charge up really fast from that. Now for your third teammate, the finisher. I think the play for him is the boss super, Shadebinder, because it is immensely powerful and can shut down every other super in the game, sometimes even just with its neutral game alone, which is really cool. Or for this third teammate, he can choose Spectral Blades and Snipe, which I think is an excellent choice because it's good to have one sniper on your team, and even better if he actually gets wall hacks for hitting headshot kills. This player, whether he's playing Shadebinder or Spectral Blades, he's like your midfielder. Take a few snipe shots, then play in the middle, supporting the Titan, maybe play a little more aggressive than the Nurse because your kit is more aggressive, and this should work quite nicely. So here's how this team deck plays out. By the Nurse anchoring and charging up her battery, she's able to keep people alive, do damage to keep the enemies afraid, and get a very fast super. She should plant the well in the middle or the end of a round to give her teammates orbs. Of course, you'd be the judge of when to pop, but I really think both teammates need to be alive for this to work. While this is happening, the Thundercrash Titan will be harassing the close range areas and getting support from their teammates and charging up their Thundercrash. Once the nurse pops her well, the Titan will eat those orbs, and if they've been doing their job, they should have a Thundercrash coming up much more quickly. If the enemy has a super up at this point, the Thundercrash should literally solo super them, and then everyone go defend that enemy's orb so they can't revive it. If the enemy's don't have a super up, the Titan should still preemptively super and try to get two kills. The point here is getting a couple more orbs for your Shade Binder or Spectral Blades. So once the well has gone off in the middle of the match and your finisher super has picked up those orbs, it's now important for them to start playing a little more carefully so they can be sure that they're alive when the Thunder Crash goes off and they get those two orbs. 
At this point, it's probably fine if the nurse starts getting aggressive because she doesn't need to charge her super anymore, and maybe even she trades out with somebody to make it easier for the Titan to push and the Thunder Crash can get some super kills for the Shade Binder. So around here, the fastest and the slowest charging super should kind of switch roles, so the nurse is midfielder and the Shade Binder is the anchor. By now, the match is coming up to a close, and this means that your slowest super player will have gotten 5 big orbs, which is a massive chunk of super energy. If they were putting in damage and getting a kill here or there throughout the match, they will absolutely have an earlier super than the opponents. And if this super is something like Shadebinder, that's the boss super that you've been charging up this whole time, and that thing can close out a match for sure. So for the player that takes this finisher role on the team, they need to be confident that they're picking a deadly tier 1 super that they can get kills with and finish out a match. So all in all, this is how one of the most powerful team decks in the game comes together. You get your battery to kickstart the mid-tier and low-tier supers, then the mid-tier player gets their super, pops it, and fills up your finisher's super the rest of the way. This team deck is immensely powerful, and I think if you build into it, and more importantly, practice with two teammates who you can rely on, ideally practicing in the flawless pool, you will get some extremely rewarding and fun wins. I played with team setups like these this season in Trials, and I can tell you that this genuinely works. I went flawless with Patty Cakes and Shadow, who are two bigger Destiny streamers slash content creators, and we used a team setup like this, with Patty on Bottom Tree Goldie and Shadow on Spectral, and me on Well of Radiance, and it seriously worked. We were up against some decent teams because Patty and Shadow are great players, but we were able to beat them with our team setup of me as the nurse, Patty as the midfielder, and Shadow as the finisher. It was absolutely awesome and some of the most fun I've ever had in PvP. So Patty and Shadow, if you guys are watching this, thanks again for a great New Year's Eve. It was a super fun way to ring in 2022. Cheers. And to everyone watching, you're never gonna believe this, but on our flawless card, we did have to spend our mercy. And guess who that team was? It was a Well of Radiance, a Thunder Crash, and a Spectral Blades. I think the Titan was actually using the fourth horseman shotgun too, which is hilariously awesome. But it was just amazing to see another team playing this exact same way that I've described and just literally doing it better. So if that team is watching, GG's y'all, for real, well done. It was super cool to see that team deck used so effectively and I think the fact that the only team that could beat my team's nurse battery deck was just a better team using the same stuff is super cool. It just goes to show how powerful teamwork and build crafting at the team level rather than the individual level really can be. Alright, well, this brings us to the final chapter of this video essay and the core reason why I wanted to make this video for you. And that's because it was just super fun. Playing in this weird way for an entire season, much like my Blink video, made me such a better player and gave me some of the most fun experiences I've ever had in Destiny. And I could not have done this if I didn't open my mind to the fact that there's more than one way to play Destiny. There's hundreds of ways to play this game. And that's why so many of us do play this game. There's thousands of different things to combine in different ways, new things to learn, and different ways to have fun. And I think that's awesome. This gets back to one of my core beliefs about gaming or basically anything, which is playing for fun and living in the moment, which sounds cheesy, but it's good advice. Video games should be fun to you. And if you're forcing yourself to play and you're not having fun, I think you're doing it wrong. I think adopting this mindset to your very core and doing things because they just feel right and feel good and fun will take you very, very far in life. And even if you just care about winning in Destiny, it's going to take you far there too, because when you commit to learning something new, you grow. Your mind actually changes and you find new ways to connect information, you think in new ways, you adapt to new situations more effectively, and you just become a much more flexible and fast player because you can see all of the moving pieces and how you can change them using the tools that you have. Adopting this flexible, bright-eyed, and open-minded approach to something is key in growing as a player in a game and as a person. If you can shed all of the previous connotations, the salt, the jadedness that you bring into a game and find new ways to think about it and play it, you will genuinely be happier and better at the game. Um, I can't see. Wow, that's really a free res. Uh, one's on my X, one's on my X. Two, two, two. Whoa. Oh, hi. Oh my god. <laughs> that was wow. awesome. That was insane. I love well. You put down the glacier nade and you said, not today. Not today. <laughs>
So do this for me, or honestly more for yourself. Try something in Destiny that's always been on your mind and that you felt wasn't quite meta enough or whatever, and just play through those doubts. Learn its ins and outs and become cracked at it. I guarantee you'll have a fun time once you start learning the nuances and it will literally cause you to grow and become a better player and a happier person. And if you remember the whole reason why you play video games, it's because they're fun. And I would say trying something new and weird aligns perfectly with that goal of just enjoying your time. Yeah, do you want to play Control with us? I would love to. Hop on in. Swag. I have a crack open divinity. <laughs> yes. I love to hear it. So go forth, little guardians. Put on your weirdest gear and have fun out there. It's worth it. All right, thanks so much for your time today, and I'll see you later. Love you. Bye-bye.